So that's spray arc welding. So it's a lot of heat, but it's not going as much into the metal. Hello and welcome to the shop. I'm Jared and this is The Questionable Garage and this is the first episode and hopefully a very large multi-part series where we get the opportunity to go into the factories that make the parts that we use in all of our builds, sometimes maybe even the tools, take a deeper look at them. Try to understand exactly what they're doing and then just take that behind the scenes look that not many of us ever get to do. I grew up watching a lot of how it's made, the Discovery Channel, that's, you know, you know, I put on car TV and science TV, and my brother and sister and I, we, we fought over who would uh, get to pick what we watched, and I usually ran home to get to the TV first. That was the general rule, and uh, we watched educational TV. So I get really excited and geeked out about that behind the scenes look. The astute among you might have noticed on the table we've got several different transmission parts. That's because our first look is what is inside a torque converter. Jeremy Clarkson famously said, you know, power goes in, magic happens, power comes out of an automatic transmission. And one of the most important parts of what goes on inside an automatic transmission is the torque converter. It's commonly called a fluid coupler, has a couple different things. There's, I understand the paper of it, but I don't, personally even understand the entire inner workings of what happens inside a torque converter. You have stalls, you have... Good gracious, it's storming outside still. That's why we're not welding outside anymore. Before we even get to a factory, let's talk about the torque converter's job in the transmission in your car when you're driving down the road. What is it doing? Well, on our left, we've got a mixture of Porsche and Toyota parts here. This... I'm sorry, Porsche. <laughs> is, that, is that better? And Toyota, you know, no, that's just the power steering cap that has the D, it is Toyota. We've got the Toyota manual transmission and the clutch from our 911. So there would be a bell housing like this part here. This is your input shaft. This is what inputs power into your transmission. And then you have your gears that happen inside. What we're worried about is the coupling between the engine and this transmission and its input shaft. So attached to your engine, you will have a flywheel. That's what this is. It has the starter ring gear built into it and a surface for the clutch disc. This is our clutch disc, and this is what will spline onto an input shaft. And the way the clutch works is fairly simple. You have your clutch cover, and it is a very heavy duty spring system that you have a release bearing that releases the spring tension, and then the spring tension reattaches. It's that simple. So in your clutch cover, you have the heavy duty springs that has another mating surface that will sandwich that clutch disc against the flywheel, gripping it, keeping it locked one to one. As the engine turns one RPM, it is clamped down, holding on your clutch disc, turning your input shaft one RPM. Now in an automatic car, you don't have a pedal to disengage or turn off that coupling. That is the job of the magical torque converter. It has really a tough task that's required of it. It needs to take the energy coming in from the engine, transmit it as efficiently as possible to the transmission, and then allow you to come to a complete stop without pushing any buttons, any levers, or anything. It has to key into the input shaft. It also has to drive the hydraulic fluid pump that controls everything. It's a relatively difficult task for some magic to happen. I've read the books, I've passed the ASC tests, I've, you know, done all the schooling and seen some of the hows it's made, but I've never actually held the parts inside a torque converter, so it's really difficult, at least for me, to understand. So, why are we starting with a torque converter? Well, I need one. I have a 71 International Harvester pickup truck that had a six liter LS engine that a tuner blew up with a 4L80 automatic behind it. And we're putting the LS3 from TryHard in it. The torque converter is not a good match. I wanted something a little bit sportier and spicier. And at SEMA, my friend Terry Coverman66 introduced me to Nelson and the team at Boss Hog Torque Converters. And talking with him, he said, hey, why don't you come out and see how these things are made? So join me on our road trip 
Well, actually, no, we're, there, there's no road trip. We're there. Just on your mark, get set, teleport. Oh, I forgot to do a transition. Do I need a jump or clap my hands? Uh, all right, we are here at Boss Hog Torque Converters in Muscle Shoals, Alabama, standing here with Nelson, the owner, and we are in the dark corner because uh, even though you're the owner, you, you have to like make torque converters. Yes, sir, <laughs> we got a lot of them, we gotta get them out. I've never seen so many torque converters in my life. We're gonna do just a little bit of a walk around later. You invited us to come on out here, see how one's made, and kind of explain, you know, at least dispel one part of the magic of an automatic transmission. Certainly. There's several things to it, but once you get past that, it's put it out in a straight line type manner, it makes a lot more sense. Yeah. The common thing you hear is a torque converter is a hydraulic coupler. It's not a viscous coupler. Viscous couplers are kind of sealed and they rely on the changing viscosity of the fluid. This is kind of set in its coupling percentages to some extent, but it's relying on the flow of fresh fluid constantly. And centrifugal force. So. What I'm going to do is I'm gonna grab the handheld, bring you guys in a little bit closer, let Nelson give you a quick little bit of history of Boss Hog, and we are gonna then tear into, this is a non-lockup converter, and we've also got a lockup converter we're gonna take a look at, and I thought we were gonna build my own torque converter, but it looks like you're set up for batch production, we kind of ruined yeah. the flow of things, so maybe just okay. off the shelf. Yeah, we'll get yours done, Stim. <laughs> you look so much taller now. Yeah, I'm not standing next to you. <laughs> <laughs> so, this, is the insides or some of the insides of a torque converter and if you just look at them they still look kind of scary and very mysterious so but it's not that scary though right correct <laughs> so we're going to break it down into the abcs as far as that goes and how torque converters work so it is um basically a hydraulic system so the top is also known as the impeller or the pump um, and when we get stall, we can get into that in just a little bit. But what we wanted to go over with you is the functionality of each individual piece as we're going through the torque converter. So this one here would be known as the pump because as you see, this is welded to the front cover as I'm gonna demonstrate like that. Okay, so front cover, but the top of the torque converter is the transmission side. The transmission side, what you would back, almost, si back side, yes. I, I would think that's the back, so I was like, wait, top, and I was like, no, that's the part that bolts to the engine. Yep. But, so that For, will bolt into the engine, mm -hmm. and those are welded together, so when your engine's turning one RPM, that is turning one, they're, they're locked yes. in 100%, and that's also, that engages the pump inside your transmission. So yeah, that is how you always have hydraulic pressure coming from the transmission. Yes. So the rotation to go assembly actually, you know, goes through that. Now, um, so this is what turns the front pump gear inside the transmission, which in turn pumps the fluid throughout the entire system. Now, as the fluid, as this is turning, this it, fluid actually gets slung outwards, just like on a merry-go-round. So if you're standing on the outside of a merry-go-round, as you pull up to the RPMs, that pressure pulling you outwards makes a huge difference. So we're controlling the speed of the fluid inside of it to control when that pressure would actually pull you outwards. So, so going to the merry-go-round, it's like you'd see who could hold on the longest when all your friends were spinning it faster and faster, or you tie the rope around it and take off with your ATV. And I think the goal was to see, you know, if you could hang on or get slung off, I guess. Right, yeah. <laughs> you sometimes would start in the middle, sometimes the challenge was the outside, but yeah. basically the fluid in the torque converter is all of us being silly kids being flung off a, off a merry-go-round, but yeah. we don't go flying away because there is a wall to kind of redirect us. Yes. So this right here is um, um, slinging outwards and then it's going to come into the outer vein here of the turbine so you can see that line connection there I'm going to take the stator away so we can kind of see what's going on so these veins are not straight across okay they are literally like a cup so this vein is the same as this vein so as you see it's, it does have that kind of a cup type um, bend right here okay so as fluid continuously comes in and then the fluid's going to come out and and as you see that fluid is going to try to hit the pickup right here now if you see this thing's not moving 
okay? But it does have a one-way sprag, which I'm gonna show you that right now. So that's actually like a one-way clutch. Now, what I'm seeing too is you always, if you install a torque converter, you always go by the rule of thumb. You need three clicks in order for it to know you're not, in, you know, you've installed it enough. Cool. First is you have your pump click, then you have the, let's see, input okay. shaft click, and so then you have the stator splines. So and as I'm, as this actually will sit there and, and, and coast with you, once you build up enough pressure, it won't allow it to move. So it has got a really n nice bite. That just simply goes on right there. It's got a snap ring that we put in. If you notice the, the, um, on the pump set of splines or the stator set of splines, they're affixed to the pump. So it's yeah. not like freewheeling or anything. So it, all it yeah. does is redirect the fluid back to the turbine, okay? So as this thing locks up, it then applies pressure and then that's what drives the car. As you remember, you still have fluid coming in here, yeah. but that back pressure is what allows you to really just take off. Seeing them in pieces, it starts to make a whole lot more sense. I'm like, wait, why do we, and I'm like, wait, no, that's, that doesn't turn with it. Yes. So what is the biggest thing that is going to affect the stall? And when we're saying stall of the torque converter, that's basically it's freewheeling speed is probably the easiest descriptor. Um, well, there's magical points that people think that, you know, it's only done by the cam. No, it's the weight of the car, it's the gear ratio. You can't have the gear ratio without ha tacking on the run out of the height of the tire. That's a combination that you have to add yourself. Um, um, the lobe separation, the center line, is what directly affects the stall as far as the cam, but the duration at 50 tells you what kind of an RPM band range the cam is in. So you have to match all of these things, and then um, the intake makes a difference, the exhaust system makes a difference. And if you literally take a look and line up all of the different items that we're looking at, there's 7,300 variables in matching one stall for one particular setup. It's a physics equation. There's a whole lot of questions. You can't just, if you call up a torque converter company and say, I want a 2300 stall converter, and they're like, you need this part number. That's the wrong way to order a torque converter. No, that's not how torque converters right. work. <laughs> <laughs> but, but is the angle of, or, or is okay, this so fin angle or how that How we fin achieve angle? stall in yeah. a torque converter. Yeah, sorry. Okay, yeah. No, no worries. Ask a better question. So, Got a good not, answer. <laughs> not a problem. So as you see, these are actually slanted counterclockwise. Now, the more counterclockwise this is angled, it's going to come back to the back side of these fins in here, which actually slows the flow of the fluid down so it can reverse direction, okay? And that S turn, the more it deadheads on these backs of these fins, the slower, it's gonna slow the fluid down. So in order for you to be able to obtain locking up this stator to apply back pressure, it's gonna take more and more and more RPM, okay? In addition to changing the stall, the, the more clockwise these get, the more direct the fluid's coming in, so there's no resistance, and that actually tightens the torque converter up. Now, you also have multiple different pitches of fins on stators. Uh, there's probably, uh, there is eight different pitches on these, so we could pick and choose and make and match stall ranges to particular applications. So, you wouldn't just want to change this pitch or that pitch because let's say you want a smoother takeoff from a stop, but then when you're under power, it would lock, you know, go into lockup without basically stall sooner. You right. could achieve that by mix matching those parts. It's not yes. just a... Having, having a stall converter is not just for race cars. You know, it's for hot rods, it's mm -hmm. for rat rods, it's for um just high performance muscle cars it's it's for the entire gambit you know if you're going to put an exhaust system on a car and you go from headers um to true dual exhaust um and um you've got say like a, a nice series 40 type muffler and then that alone can take the factory stall converter and, and lower it it will tighten it up because they're it's taking the back pressure off so the torque converter does not sense resistance 
and locks up 300 to 400 RPM earlier, depending on the diameter of pipe in addition to that. That's just That's, an exhaust system. Yeah, that, there's a lot to go into it, but at the end of the day, it's you're directing fluid pressure. But no matter how exactly. good you make this, there is technically always some energy loss through this style torque converter. Correct. And that's kind of plagued the industry forever. And then the government said, you need to be much more efficient. And then people are like, hey, we kind of want all of our horsepower we can get. Yeah. So that invented or uh, caused the invention of a lockup torque converter. So yes. I guess let's pull the lock or before I do that, is there anything else you want to show on this one? I don't want to rush us along. Well, this right here, <clears throat> as you see, is an outlaw series converter. Yep. So we have all the fins that are tacked yeah. up individually. Okay, and then we also have, you know, running beads on the fins. So this converter will handle nitrous, trans brake. This is about a 1400 horsepower machine. Uh, we have our own anti-ballooning plates that we see and see in-house, along with several of our components as well. We actually have all of the converters up. That, that's something we'll talk about here in a second. But what we were, he was pointing out, Nelson was pointing out is, you can very plainly see the difference in stall in these. So looking at the stator, you can see that pitch looks like a nice wing where that is just a scoop. And then the other thing I realized, so this part stays the same. The turbine is the same no matter what. You get your stall from your covers and your stators. And then we were talking about the angle. You can very, oh, that works. Yeah, your pen will show that real well, that angle. And then you come to here and see how much more vertical that is. So this is a much tighter torque converter, more fuel efficiency, basic, standard, street car, and all of that. And then we've no. got, oh, this doesn't have a lockup disc, does it? Yes, it does. Oh, we're getting into it. So the lockup disc, what that ends up doing is it clamps the covers together so you get a one-to-one -one ratio, effectively. This is a 700 R4, and we actually have our lockup right here on the back side of the turbine. On ours, there's no need for the end of the input shaft O-ring. The O-rings so that we, always fail. We, we've been delete. We've been able to delete that, you know. Um, and this right here is a return spring, so it also so it helps you do the kick down. So as you see, that O-ring is going to ride right here. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So it's got a nice place right there for it to actually, you know, hook up and, and, and do drive. So once it's installed, you can see it's got a yep. nice return on it. It's good and sealed. That's, and then, so what happens is it applies pressure outside a lockup to push this away, correct? Correct. Yeah. And then anytime you're not, Mm -hmm. It then bites into your front cover. Yes. Now, you still may get small amounts of slip, but you really don't want any because you burn that clutch up really quickly. But that is intended to make this a direct coupling for fuel efficiency, sportiness. Yes. Every, it, it fixes everything. And it goes into overdrive, so it's less than one to one. So, you know, you're going to yeah. get that deeper, longer stroke, so you get better fuel mileage, you know, yeah. and it can make your vehicle a lot more drivable that way yeah. as well. That visualizes a ton for me. I, I hope you guys are appreciating this, because again, I have a reasonable understanding, but seeing parts and pieces, which there are a tremendous amount of parts and pieces here. We'll, we'll look at some of that. One of the things I really like doing here is showing you don't always have to spend a lot of money. I don't always follow that advice, and I buy a lot of really expensive stuff. But you and your home garage, you don't always need the top shelf because if you spend all your money on a torque converter you don't need, you can't put tires on it, you can't put fuel in it, like you, you're not able to play and, and keep going. This is torque converter you have, and there are times it's appropriate. Yes. But that is probably the converter most companies will just sell if you call up for. They're yes. like, if you've got the budget for it, buy this. This is the billet Mac Daddy, I mean, fully centered, correct? This. This right here is the turbine. Now the yeah. turbines don't really change. We want to always, now these are furnace braced as well, all throughout. And um, so we don't change the angles on this. So primarily the stator and the uh, the pump impeller or, or the top, the back half, depending yeah. on where you come from. <laughs> um, this snout is called an impeller hub. 
So, um, I mean, I've heard all kinds of names. Right. <laughs> so we have that. And on the, on the crankshaft side, that's actually a crankshaft pilot. Now, this one is a lockup. So um, this one here is a triple disc. You can see it really needs to have these really strong plates in it. Then you'll have the, uh, the clutches throughout. This right here is just a, uh, a buffer for the turbine to sit so that it'll rotate fine and freely. Now, the unique thing is, is I want you to feel how heavy this thing yeah. is. All right, it's hard to indicate, but one, it's, I'm right-handed, but 20 pounds, <laughs> maybe, like it's. Well, how about this? Just this is two pounds lighter than my entire torque converter right here. That whole thing. Yeah, it, like just by <laughs> the hand, it close. feels the same. Yeah. But there's a time you absolutely do need that. Yes. If you are a giant diesel, needing triple lockup, if you're a TH400, like mullet, what Garrett runs, Cletus McFarland, yeah. and you're going in lockup with nearly 3,000 horsepower, you going need that. One to one and racing, going down the track and that kind of stuff, yes. There, there's um, an appropriate time. But but as far as billet front covers are concerned, I've got parts that, that handle, you know, in, in over a thousand horsepower, uh, 14, 1800 horsepower with a single disc, okay? Yes, they do work. Um, the triple disc, you know, for a higher performance using fourth gear, yes, I, that makes sense. Yeah. But. I feel that a lot of people um, over-purchase on, on, on the triple disc clutches and, and they're spending almost double the amount of money they, that they need. They didn't have to. Right. I get wanting to spend more if you're gaining guaranteed reliability, but it's one of those things that you're not, depending on your power level, you don't need something that big. You can get away with something not inferior, just cheaper and lighter and when we're talking a lighter, that's very important because this is yes. your engine spinning it. You you lose a lot of horsepower. There's a story we can't directly talk about, but there may or may not be dyno numbers that prove a lighter torque converter. Well, we could get into that. In some cases, you know, um, we do have one of the lightest 4L80s that's on the market today, and I don't mean by two pounds or three pounds. Um, that's one of our fortes is trying to shave off rotating mass and having the strongest, most durable, toughest torque converter on the market. But when you could beat a torque converter by 19 pounds, that's like, you know, huge. When people will fight and pay thousands of dollars just to take one pound of rotating mass off the assembly. You know, I mean, that, that in itself is huge. In one case, where we have found as much as 70 horsepower in, in a setup. To, to the ground. Yes, to the ground, not, not the not, flywheel. Not chassis, not flywheel, yeah. or, you know, or chassis, like on, on the ground, and yeah. you don't feel five or six horsepower. You, you feel 70. Yes. So that is why Johnny Rev is getting a lockup. What did you spec out for me? Because again, it's an LS3, so mm -hmm. it's a four, four, 30-ish horsepower engine, mm -hmm. uh, mild cam, it's gonna see, you know, it, it's 4L80, so we're not revving yeah. it to what an LS3 can rev to, but you know, yeah. the six out, it's in a pickup truck, 4,200 pound truck with, oh, let's see, 20 inches, uh, 373s in back. Yeah. You know, I, you can I'm just do go that with, in your uh, head, right? Um, <laughs> yes, I can. <laughs> um, with your particular application, I'm gonna be looking at like a, between 22, 2400 RPM, uh, tight 10 inch uh, stall converter, but I'm gonna go with an, uh, an Outlaw series to handle the power and um, also a super lightweight converter. But not necessarily power, but you know, you know that I drive the truck hard. So yeah, <laughs> well, it's also six, 16 to 18 pounds lighter than the factory core. So it's gonna wrap up a heck of a lot faster. It's gonna engage faster. Uh, now that will produce more heat, but you know, you do have the gear ratio to help support that. And being yeah. a lockup, we, we have a way to fight that as well. Again, this is hydraulics and hydraulics can do some really mean things. Oh yeah, man. I so, mean, well, that's why we use uh, what is it? Bernelli's principle. Yeah. So <laughs> it, it works in torque converters and construction equipment and Pretty much everything. It's yes, funny sir. how that works.
All right, well, let's take a look at uh, some of the cool stuff that we're able to show, except for that one thing you said we couldn't look at, right? Oh, that's right. That Couldn't really see that direction. So that's spray arc welding. So it's a lot of heat, but it's not going as much into the metal. It's actually six to eight times the deposition rate. So yeah, it's it's by far a lot stronger than your normal globular right. welding. And because it's so hot, you're very limited on on your angles that you can actually weld. So it's not as versatile, but being six to eight times stronger, it really lends that hand in there. All right, Jackson, so you just welded up a couple snaps for us, appreciate that. I wanted to kind of ask, because one, there's a lot of torque converter parts in here. Uh, how many snouts do you weld in a day? I can clear 500. 500? 500. How many years of welding did you have before coming in here? I had zero, nothing. I knew nothing about welding. I'll tell you what, those beads look pretty good, so. <laughs> Thank Go, you, goes man. to show practical experience sometimes uh, outweighs schooling. Yes, sir. All right, so we saw that get cut, and now we have some of that removed, and what is the goal of that? So, as this would come in, the, the, the fluid would hit this, but it's, we'd knock that shelf off, so it won't pick it up as early or apply as much pressure at an earlier RPM. So this is actually gonna increase the stall in the converter. All right, so here, he is getting all of the pilots to be able to then put these on tack them in before that spray process we saw with Jackson. And you do that start stop just to make sure it's true and yep. centered. Sure true. And then you can see the penetration in there. Yep. After it gets welded, it'll go to clean up. And then it gets cleaned up, up and then it gets yep. blasted. And yep. Only a couple hundred more to go. So here are some turbines. And if you notice, there's no splines on that. So again, you're using a rel relatively universal core yes. that you cut, machine all of those parts, yes. and... Yeah, this one core we can make fit 39 different transmissions. So we'll go show you the broaching process. It's kind of cool. It's a long rod that gets pulled through progressively wider until you get your finished result, so... As he's putting that in, you can see there's nothing those splines that comes in and just gets pulled by a hydraulic ram slowly, right? Right. I think this is the messiest of all the jobs here. It is. It is. <laughs> and they go off to washing and yes. back into boxes and then they work their way back there. And thanks to Movie Magic, we are back here in Georgia and we've got our new torque converter. So coming up in a future episode here, hopefully sooner than later, because I want my truck back, we're gonna get Johnny Rev back in here. We're gonna get the LS3 bolted in, paired with the perfect torque converter for that truck, our combo. I'm really looking forward to it. It's one of those things, it's really difficult to know what you need to pick working with a company or team that has a good tech background to make sure you get the product you need. Because there's nothing worse than buying a new part and it not working as expected.
ask the questions, everyone's happier. You get the right part and you don't have an angry return as a company that's selling you the right part. So again, Nelson and the team, thank you for letting me interrupt your day. I was blown away at the sheer number of torque converters in there. Absolutely unreal. So I hope you guys really had fun on this kind of behind the scenes look. Hopefully you learned a little bit more about how the magic happens inside the torque converter. If you've got any more questions, comment below. I will try to answer them. Or if I don't know the answer, I'll get Nelson or any of you who are more knowledgeable on the topic, answer those questions, help each other out. Let us all get a little bit smarter. Cause again, we are way smarter than just me. Now, if there is a particular part, a shock, suspension, ball joint, uh, maybe turbo, if there's something you really wanna see how it's made, a behind the scenes look of the manufacturing process, comment that as well, so I can try to find some companies that are willing to let you know, someone invade their, their space with a camera, interrupt their workflow, so we can all learn, understand a little bit more about a good product, so we can all get our cars working just, you know, a little bit better. Um, there's really nothing worse than putting a new part on that you immediately have to take it back off because it didn't do what you were expecting. But as always, I appreciate you guys hanging out with me in the shop, even if we're not directly wrenching, but we are learning. Again, I, I, was, I was geeking out there. I hope you guys did a little bit too. I'm Jared reminding you guys to always make questionable choices and uh, uh, pick, pick the right stall. I knew the ending was coming and I didn't have anything better to say. Good job, Jared. It's not like you've only made 200 plus of these things.